Hey Optimancers, Chris here. If you would like an analysis of the subclasses and optional class features in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, you're in the right place. I've gone through most of the subclasses already, with only the bees remaining, bards and barbarians. Today I'm going to be discussing bards. There is only one new subclass of bard in Tasha's, the College of Creation, which we're going to be going through today. College of Eloquence is also in Tasha's, but it's a reprint from Mythic Odysseys of Theros, and I've reviewed it already, so if you want to check out that review, I'll link it in the video description for you. I'm also going to be looking at the optional class features for bards, but before we do that, I want to recognize some of the patrons of this channel. If you would like to support this channel, the link is provided in the video description. Patrons enjoy rewards such as early releases of ad-free versions of these videos, as well, my Archmage patrons join me for D&D sessions each month. Today, I want to recognize Thomas Barrero, Geek Dice, Jay Gemmel, Joseph Robido, and Stephen Edmondson. Thank you all for your continued support. Let's get started. So to begin with, let's go through the optional class features for Bard. And I think we should start with the additional Bard spells. This is a really juicy list. There are 13 spells on this list that aren't new spells from Tasha's, which is really a huge boost to the base Bard spell list. In terms of new spells from Tasha's, the Bard actually got very little. But in terms of spells added from the player's handbook, this list is really substantial. With the first level spells, we have two new options. They're both decent. Neither of these spells are ones I would necessarily consider standouts on the first level bard spell list, however. Second level spells are another matter. Aid is a fantastic spell that significantly alters what a bard is already capable of. What I appreciate here is that Aid is a spell that heals and buffs, and both of those things I would thematically associate with bards, so I think this is a really good fit. Mirror Image is another spell I think fits well thematically. However, I think it's also important to recognize that Mirror Image represents a significant change in what Bard spells can do. When we look at the previously existing Bard spell list, we can see a definite lack of defensive spells from level 1 and level 2 spells. No Shield spell, no Mage Armor, no Blur spell, no Misty Step. Adding Mirror Image now gives the Bard a defensive spell of low level they can cast, and a pretty good one too. Now it's not helping you at levels 1 and 2, but it could help quite a bit afterwards. In fact, Aid in Mirror Image will probably be near the top of the list when it comes to picking second level spells for Bards, for me, moving forward. Enlarge Reduce is actually a good spell too, though I don't think it represents the kind of boost that either Aid or Mirror Image do. With level 3 spells, we get the new Intellect Fortress spell, which is pretty situational. We also get Mass Healing Word, which, depending how you run the Aid spell, may not be much of an improvement over that spell. Then we add Slow, and again, I think this is a really big boost for Bards. One thing that Bards can struggle with are creatures that are immune to the Charmed or Frightened condition. They can also struggle with dealing with crowds of enemies once those enemies get mixed up with allies. Slow is a good spell to deal with both those situations. In case of creatures that have large numbers of attacks, Slow can practically shut them down entirely. But in almost every case, Slow is a pretty good debuff that can give your side the edge in a combat, which is often all you need to do when you are a control caster. Now once we get to 4th level spells, we get Phantasmal Killer, which personally I would not bother with. At level 5, we get Rary's Telepathic Bond, which is a pretty good ritual to consider. Uh, so if you are looking to conserve your spell slots, but still put on a pretty good spell, that is a spell I would think about. At 6th level, we get Hero's Feast, which is a good spell, but it's also an expensive spell to cast. And when it comes to classes that have spells known, rather than preparations of spells, it's not the kind of spell I would go for. At 7th level, we get Dream of the Blue Veil, which is just a DM tool, and I wouldn't even consider it unless my DM felt it was appropriate to their campaign. And there's also Prismatic Spray, which is not a very good spell. At 8th level, we get Antipathy Sympathy, which is probably as good as any of the 8th level spells that Bards can get. 
Then with our ninth level list, we're adding Prismatic Wall, which is a great ninth level option, giving us probably three good options with our ninth level spells with True Polymorph and Foresight. And all three of these spells do radically different things, giving us some real diversity of our options. So when it comes to the expanded spell lists, I'm of the opinion that Bards made out the best of any spellcasting class overall. Speaking of Bards making out well, Magical Inspiration takes what is already a pretty good ability and makes it significantly better. In addition to boosting attack rolls, ability checks, and saving throws, our Inspiration can now be applied to spells as well, if they recover hit points or deal damage. Considering how many classes in the game cast spells, this is a pretty big boost. And considering that previously Valor Bards were the only subclass that had an Inspiration dice that could be added to damage of any kind, I would say this actually kind of waters that down a bit by giving a damage option to any Bard's Inspiration. I should point out that in the case of spells that heal or deal damage to multiple targets, Magical Inspiration can only boost the result for a single target affected by the spell. This was a concern of mine as the ability was presented in Unearthed Arcana, and I'm glad to see it's been addressed in the official version. I would also like to point out that if you want to add this boost to the damage you deal with a weapon, that can be done. You just need the Inspired Ally to be using something like Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade, and then you can add to the cantrip damage, thus adding to the damage you're dealing with that weapon. When we look at a spell like Healing Word, that's normally healing about 5 or 6 points at low levels, adding 3 or 4 more is quite a significant boost. More than scaling the spell by a level for sure. Now I will say that a failed saving throw is still probably going to be your biggest bang for your buck when you spend Inspiration. However, it's not uncommon to have Inspiration and have difficulty spending it. Maybe you aren't making any saving throws. Maybe your attack rolls are either hitting or they're missing by amounts that are too great for Inspiration to make a difference. Maybe you aren't making ability checks. Magical Inspiration can give you a pretty reliable way to use that Inspiration you've been sitting on if you figure you're not going to need it elsewhere. At 4th level we get Bardic Versatility. This provides the standard benefit that all cantrip casters receive where they can switch out a cantrip when they receive an ability score improvement. With Bards I could see something like switching a Vicious Mockery which can be a decent cantrip at low levels, but not so great at higher levels, so then you switch it out for something else later on. Bards also get the ability to switch out a skill expertise, which is pretty unique. I'll note that rogues do not get this option. I would not always jump on this option, but there are times where we might find a skill we assumed would have come up a lot just isn't, so being able to switch it out could be really beneficial. Let me give you an example. Let's say we're in a campaign and our bard has a low strength score. So we figure we might need athletics for climbing or jumping checks. So we decide to grab expertise to make up for that lacking of strength. And then we find out later on, our DM says that using acrobatics for these checks is just fine. Being able to switch out that expertise for something else could come in really handy. So that's all the optional class features received for the bards. I think Bards did very well here. The expanded spell list is very good. Our Inspiration, which is an iconic ability, got a pretty big boost. And we got some added flexibility with cantrips and expertise. As a DM, I'm not sure all these boosts were necessary. And I do think the new boost to Inspiration can water down the Valor Bards special ability to a certain degree. Though I don't see any of them being problematic. So personally I wouldn't hesitate allowing them to bard players. And that brings us to our new bard subclass, the College of Creation. So here is where I describe the theme of the subclass normally. This one's a bit weird as described in Tasha's. It says, before the sun and the moon there was the song, and its music awoke the first dawn. Its melodies so delighted the stones and trees that some of them gained a voice of their own. And now they sing too. Learn the song, students, and you too can teach the mountains to sing and dance. So I guess the theme is that your music makes inanimate objects animate. Maybe it's just me, but that seems a bit like reverse engineering. 
like they came up with some interesting abilities and then they tried to figure out how to make a Bard subclass theme around those abilities rather than the other way around. That said, there are some interesting abilities that seem like fun to play. So I can forgive a bit of reverse engineering and I expect a lot of players will come up with more interesting concepts to fit these abilities beyond what's presented in the book. So let's get into the abilities. At third level we're going to get two abilities. The first is called Moat of Potential. This boosts our Bardic Inspiration dice. Specifically when we use it to boost an ability check, attack roll, or saving throw, which before Tasha's was the entire list of what they could be used on. When we use the Bardic Inspiration die on an ability check, the creature essentially rolls the Bardic Inspiration with advantage, uh, as in they're rolling it twice and choosing the higher result. Now, if we use the Bardic Inspiration die on an attack roll, we can potentially add some damage to the attack roll as well. This is thunder damage, and it can affect additional targets within five feet of the creature being attacked. There's a constitution saving throw, and if they make it, they don't take any damage. Now, if we use it on a saving throw, the creature that made the saving throw also gains temporary hit points equal to the Bardic Inspiration die roll plus your Charisma modifier. Now, what I'm going to point out here is that if we're using the improved Bardic Inspiration on either an attack roll or a saving throw, we are getting a benefit even if the Bardic Inspiration didn't turn our failure into a success. In fact, we could even use the Bardic Inspiration if there's no chance for it to turn a failure into a success or even if the original roll already succeeded, just to get the additional effect. Depending on the situation, I could see doing exactly that. All three of these options are pretty good. Depending on enemy positions, the extra damage could end up being a lot more than you would get with Combat Inspiration, for example. The bonus temporary hit points, similarly, could end up being more than you would get from a Glamour Bard's Mantle of Inspiration, at least at lower levels, so, with all three combined, this is a pretty big boost to Bardic Inspiration. A lot of subclasses give alternatives for where you could use your Bardic Inspiration points, like Cutting Words or Blade Flourish, but this is instead Bardic Inspiration, but better. Very nice. We also get Performance of Creation at third level. This allows you to create an item within 10 feet of you. This item lasts a number of hours equal to your proficiency bonus, and it has a limit value of 20 times your bard level. You have a limit of once per long rest, unless you use a second level spell slot or higher to use it again, and regardless, you can only have one object at a time. This can create medium or smaller objects when you first get this ability, but it scales with level, eventually allowing for huge objects. So this is one of those abilities that is going to serve a creative player more than a non-creative one. The obvious use of this is to create that equipment item that you needed when you need it. For example, maybe the fighter's weapon just got eaten away by a gray ooze, so you create them a replacement. Maybe the lock couldn't be picked and nobody packed a crowbar. A raft might get you across that murky water you would rather not wade into. Maybe someone forgot to get winter's clothing in a cold environment and suddenly your DM is calling for constitution saving throws. Or maybe you forgot to buy a grappling hook. There are more creative uses though. I note that there doesn't seem to be a weight limit, even though there's a size limit. So, a medium-sized block of stone in front of that door seems like a pretty effective way to prevent it from being opened. That same block of stone might sink the rowboat the enemy is sitting in, though that might depend on how your DM reads the line, the item must appear on a surface or liquid that can support it. In combat, this could simply create full cover. You can step behind after casting your spells. I think there's lots of uses here if we think about it, and more unique options will probably come up in gameplay if you keep your eyes open for them. That brings us to 6th level, and we get the Animating Performance feature. This is the College of Creation's Pet option. This allows us an action to animate a large or smaller non-magical item, which becomes a magical construct that obeys our commands. The animation lasts for one hour, unless we're reduced to zero hit points or we die. Like with most pets, it takes its turn immediately after ours, and we need to use our bonus action if we wanted to do anything other than the dodge action. What's different here is when we give out our Bardic Inspiration, we can use the same bonus action to command the construct. So we have less bonus action conflict 
than other pet users normally deal with. We can do this once per long rest unless we spend a spell slot of third level or higher to do it again, which frankly is probably totally worth it, certainly at higher levels as this is scaling with our levels. The stat block of the animated object is pretty much in line with the other pet options in Tasha's. One thing that's unique is the irrepressible dance feature. This is really, really good. When a creature starts its turn within 10 feet of the construct, their walking speed can be increased or decreased by 10 feet until the end of their turn. This requires no action, this doesn't require a reaction by the item, and it's not limited in uses. So merely having this creature near the party can increase everyone's walking speed by 10. Having this near an enemy will automatically reduce their movement. This isn't like the Leviathan's Warlock Tentacle where it has to hit with an attack. This is automatic and it can affect multiple enemies while buffing allies at the same time. So the item is really, really nice. But is it broken? Well, I think that depends on how this feature is arbitrated by the DM because I think it could be. The reason for that is when you use this feature, it says you can target a large or smaller object within 30 feet of you. Can that be the enemy's armor? Can it be their weapon? Well, the ability doesn't say. One might also wonder if it could be your armor. The construct can fly, so that could be flight for you, or maybe just a movement on your turn, and then another movement on your construct's turn. So yes, this feature could take you into broken territory if there aren't some restrictions on what can be animated beyond any non-magical item in range. I think a pretty reasonable restriction on this is to limit it to unattended objects. Also, an understanding with your players on not trying to game this too much is probably a good idea. I don't think this is something that needs to be banned, but I do think there needs to be some clarification on what kind of feature you are expecting from this if you want to avoid rules lawyering in-game and a potentially disappointed player. But I do think you are going to find this is a perfectly reasonable feature with some reasonable agreements on what it can and cannot do. That takes us to 14th level and creative crescendo. This allows us to create multiple objects with our performance of creation up to our charisma modifier. All but one of these items must be small or tiny and there is no longer a gold piece restriction on what you can create. So, creating full plate armor is now possible. You could also conceivably choose some very unusual materials. Your druid might be interested in some unusual half plate that's not made from metal, for example. Since you can create huge items, you could potentially create an adamantine fort if it's small enough, or a mini tower. Once again, the DM is going to need to be involved in limits here. I mean, you can make the druid half plate made out of bone, but does bone have the same defensive property that steel does? Is there another non-metal material that does? So the College of Creation definitely has some cool abilities, but I think this is a subclass that really requires some good communication with the DM to ensure everyone is happy with what it can and cannot do. This subclass seems to have multiple abilities that could be pretty useless if the DM is overly restrictive on what they can do, while potentially game-breaking abilities if the DM places no restrictions. So it's not a subclass I would be using without a bit of thought and a good relationship with your players where everyone understands what kind of campaign you are looking to create. So when I develop an overall impression here, I think this subclass is quite good. But again, this assumes my players and I are approximately on the same page as to what to expect from some of these features. And I do think this is a subclass that benefits more from a player who's quick on their feet in determining creative uses of these abilities than someone who isn't. I am also curious if any of you have found issues interpreting what some of these abilities should and shouldn't be capable of doing. Let's discuss that in the comments section. And until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks everyone, and I'll talk to you again soon.